Thanks, Hamilton. Um, and thanks to everyone for um, tuning in to this first ever Prudential webinar. Today, my presentation is going to focus on the Prudential Equity Fund. And uh, these are, as Hamilton introduced, extraordinary times. We believe that there are exceptional opportunities available to us today. And I'm going to try and leave you with a clear message of um, why that is and having a look at the, um, the idea that today is a, you know, we're being presented with the opportunity to invest in South African equities. I will be using four recent examples um, of um, opportunities that have been implemented in the fund. To kick off, I um, came across this quote in an article I was reading last month, and I think it's very apt uh, to this uh, message. Um, there is no question that in a month like March, where our market um, and, and those of global markets have uh, fallen, uh, losing more than a third of its value, um, it doesn't, it's counterintuitive, um, the quote, but what, um, what, what I'd like to leave you with is that these events, these crises, create opportunities and um, that the potential to generate exceptional returns from this point forward um, hopefully will make up for the, the short-term pain and uh, negative impact of having um, experienced a, a, a down market. I think it's important to just uh, reflect or refresh everyone, you're all familiar with Prudential, um, but there are three core principles that underpin our philosophy. Uh, first, and, you know, first and foremost, we are valuation based. By that, I'm uh, referring to the fact that in making a decision to buy or sell a stock, um, that decision is based on an assessment of what we believe the asset is worth. Um, and where possible, we are looking you know, to buy assets trading at deep discounts to that assessed um, fair value. Secondly, it's in our name, but we are prudent investors. By this, I mean we seek to construct a portfolio that is diversified um, and that uh, takes measured positions. Uh, we seek to, we recognize that sometimes our view on the world may be wrong um, and that you know, we give equal consideration both to the stocks that we put into the portfolio as well as those that we leave out and uh, Im implement um, you know, measured uh, size of position relative to the expected return. And lastly, and I think this is probably the most important uh, you know, message for today, is that it's very easy to get caught up in all the negative noise and the news that we hear on a daily basis. Um, but that we are seeking, you know, we're taking a longer term view, playing the long game, um, trying to identify those companies that we think will be here um, in the future and that have uh, sustainable businesses and to um, take advantage of the uh, discount at which they potentially uh, trade today. So where do we find ourselves today? This uh, graphic on screen is uh, taken from last week's uh, Financial Times. Um, it represents uh, by country uh, the fact that, you know, in this uh, pa global pandemic uh, caused by the coronavirus, there are very clear, there's clear evidence um, of a um, increasing loss of life. Um, so excess deaths relative to sort of a typical average. Um, but I hate to say this, but this is not what the market is concerned about. It's not, you know, the number of people uh, that have died to date is approaching a quarter of a million. But what the market is worried about are the consequences of the political decisions to uh, enter into, you know, a lockdown in order to try and stem the transmission of the virus. Um, what we can see on the chart on the right is uh, U.S. Employ employment uh, st uh, statistics. And in a very short space of time, so in the, you know, in the course of the last eight weeks, the U.S. Um, US uh, job market has lost you know, 21 million jobs. To put that in perspective, it's all of the jobs that were created in the last uh, decade, so since the financial crisis. Um, it remains to be seen whether these jobs are permanently lost. We don't think so, as and when you know, business uh, you know, restarts and the economy restarts. Um, you know, hopefully there'll, there'll be a recovery. 
Um, but the, 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 the heading of the title, Corona Coma, um, is a term coined by U.S. economist Paul Krugman. And in, it, in, it, in his article in the New York Times, he, he, had, he sort of described the fact that this is not a conventional recession. This was not a financial crisis uh, caused by a demand, you know, um, demand slowdown that, you know, uh, through, you know, as we would typically expect. Instead, this is the equivalent of a medically induced coma. Um, policy decisions that effectively have stalled the global economy as countries around the world have embarked on these lockdowns. So every day we get these daily updates of who's infected and all the bad news. Um, and so it's very easy to sort of you know, uh, challenge my optimistic outlook. But I think what's important is we have to um, focus on what are we being, you know, what's in the price, what is the market discounting, and whether or not that presents an opportunity. So in this, uh, pro, you know, this valuation series, it's a very long series. It represents 40 years of data on the South African market. Um, this is the price to book um, of, of, the, of the, you know, the index, um, the South African equity uh, market. And in the month of March, we saw that the, the, you know, as a result of the price falling um, more than 35%, uh, this, this valuation multiple is the lowest in 40 years. So, you know, we see this as being a very interesting barometer of the value opportunity presented to you as an investor. Or, um, and that even though we've had a sort of a recovery uh, in, in April, we are still trading, you know, at or below levels seen in previous crises. So the global financial crisis of 2008, um, the early 2000s, and going all the way back to um, uh, the Rubicon uh, event in, in the early 80s. If one compares this to the rest of the world, um, here we have the price to book of the world market. Um, it too has uh, fallen, but unlike South Africa, uh, the, 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 the price to book multiple um, simply pulled back to its median of around two times and uh, didn't pull back nearly to the same extent and, and uh, is, is not as low as it was in the global financial crisis. We think that this presents an interesting opportunity and that you know, there's a strong case to be made that there are uh, potentially uh, better investment opportunities in South Africa today uh, than you know, are available to you as a, an, an offshore investor. If we take that 40 year history um, and have a look at uh, had you bought at you know, different points um, in, in time at a given price to book multiple, uh, what the subsequent five year returns were, we can see that there's a clear relationship. So the, you know, as the old adage goes, um, price is what you pay, value is what you get. And so the higher the price to book, the lower the prospective or subsequent five-year returns um, delivered to you are. Whereas, you know, the red vertical line represents where, where that price to book multiple is on the, JS, uh, on the JSC as, a, as at the end of April. Um, interestingly, the blue dot to the left of the red line was in fact the month of March. Um, and uh, what one can see is that while there's a range, the vertical line is the full range of potential um, prospective returns, um, given you know, past history, you are being given what we think high odds on delivering above average returns, given the low multiple on offer uh, to own SA equities today. As an alternative measure of value, um, to look at what valuation signal is being presented um, uh, from, by, the, by the market today. What we've done here is we've ranked all the companies uh, making up the, the, the All Share Index uh, by their, their dividend yield. And we've uh, taken the top half of the so-called high yielding stocks or so-called value stocks. Um, we've compared the median of the value basket uh, to the median stock or the 25th percentile stock um, in, the, in the bottom half, uh, so the non-value. And this red series represents that differential in yield. So in the month of March, at the extreme low point of the market, um, um, 
you could see that you were being offered almost 8% additional yield to own that out of favor value uh, basket or value stock um, over and above the yield at which the, the non-value traded it. Now there's certainly um, views in the market that these dividends uh, may be postponed or suspended. Um, the point here is that while that may be the case for the coming year, we don't think that dividends will be indefinitely postponed, you know, um, lost and that at a point in the future, this uh, value uh, uh, uplift of yield can be, you know, can be realized. So moving on to the stocks, um, um, I'm going to give four examples today of opportunities uh, that, we, that have been presented to us. Um, the first is Sassol. This is a company uh, that has um, been in the portfolio and over the course of the last 12 months has been a significant detractor to performance. In hindsight, it's a stock that we potentially, you know, we wish we didn't own. Um, and, you know, what, what, one, what I'm showing in the chart here in the red columns is the, is the total debt and um, overlaid is the uh, dollar per barrel Brent oil price. Sassol derives its profitability and revenues are, are directly linked to that oil price. Um, and the market is clearly concerned about uh, the, 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 the health or lack of thereof of Sassel's balance sheet, given this very large uh, debt um, in excess of 160 billion uh, rand. Um, in an environment where, you know, this is a perfect example of a, of, of a commodity that is caught up um, in the, in the, the, the uh, has been impacted by the coronavirus. So a lockdown has resulted in, you know, people not driving, uh, planes are, are grounded and therefore um, oil reflects a demand shock um, and you know uh, we certainly had, did not anticipate the extent to which oil has fallen from um, 80, 80 uh, from sorry $60 a barrel uh, to as low as $20 uh, last month. So today I'm going to talk about that debt and uh, the, the balance sheet of Sassel. Where, what, why, where does this debt come from? This is an image of the Lake Charles Cracker Project in uh, Louisiana, the United States of America. This is a mega project um, that uh, Sassel has embarked on uh, four years ago. Um, initial estimates were that it was going to cost between eight, eight and nine billion dollars to, to construct. Um, as it turns out, and what has been a huge disappointment for Sassel shareholders, is the extent of the cost overruns, uh, costing more than twelve and a half billion dollars. Um, and this largely is 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 the debt that we see today. So this chart is particularly busy, and I'm going to spend some time just unpacking it for you. Um, what we've uh, tried to, um, to to show here is a an assessment of the carrying value. As, as per Sassel's financial uh, reports. Um, so on the, above the X, above the X axis, axis is the, the net is the assets um, by division and uh, below the axis is the liabilities. Uh, the blue um, solid line that runs over the, uh, you know, through the, the middle of the stack um, represents the net assets of Sassel. That is the sum of the total assets less the liabilities. Um, and what one can observe here is that the net assets um, as they stand today um, reflect the fact that there is very little, if any, value contribution from that cracker project. So the Lake Charles cracker is in the, the mustard color at the top of the stack. Um, but what we can see is that over the four years, uh, that project was funded uh, through uh, debt uh, in the bright red at the bottom of the chart and the, the extent of the debt um, uh, today as a result of the weakening rand, most of this debt is dollar denominated, is around 200 billion um, uh, including other liabilities and that, the, those, that, that, that negative value is almost a matching uh, a, a value for that uh, Lake Charles cracker. Um, what we've done in that last April 20 column is we've assumed that the cracker is actually only worth 
uh, $9 billion, uh, what it was intended to uh, cost to build. And um, the reason there's uh, no difference to the, pre the, the last reported December uh, data point is that the currency has effectively uh, de de uh, depreciated by um, almost a third um, and matches the sort of lowering uh, or reduction in, in that cost from the 12 and a half. Um, what one can see in the solid dark line is the market capitalization of Sassel. And here we can observe that in relation to the blue line, um, Sassel is trading at a very deep discount to its book value or its net assets. The pink line is the market cap plus the debt. So that's what is referred to as the enterprise value of the business. And so what um, the market is clearly concerned about is how does Sassel repay this huge debt burden in an environment of low oil and uh, constrained uh, profit generation. Um, the, 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 what the management have undertaken is that they are going to, uh, before turning to shareholders to fund, uh, you know, sort of recapitalization of the business, they would ideally like to uh, look at selling a portion of or a significant stake in the cracker uh, to a strategic investor and use those proceeds to pay down debt. But my point today is not to discuss Sassel's equity, but it's to focus on the, the red. It's the, it's the opportunity presented to us by the market to actually take a position in Sassel's debt. So in, in these charts, what I'm showing you, Sassel has three uh, dollar denominated bonds, corporate bonds, uh, each with a different uh, maturity, uh, 2022, 2024, and 2028. Um, to, uh, maturity prof uh, uh, profile. In the event of this crisis, the fall in the low oil price um, prompted a downgrade to this debt that we believe contributed to the forced selling. And in the top chart, we can see that the bonds went from having traded at face value of 100 and in, in, the, in the course of March um, bottomed at around 40 cents in the dollar. The chart on the very bottom is, is just the, the 2024 bond. It's the yield uh, to maturity. And we can see that, you know, initially those bonds were trading, as I say, at face value, yielding uh, their coupon rate of uh, just less than 6%. Um, and that in the, as a result of the price fall, those yields uh, rose to, to around 30%. Um, as, well, as one can see, the, the, the price of the bond has since rallied. Um, in the Prudential Equity Fund, I, 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 I can imagine that there's some skepticism as to why we're looking at the bond market in an equity fund. But the point I'm trying to make here is that there was an opportunity to buy these bonds trading at a deep discount to their face value um, and that um, they, they offered equity-like returns. Uh, we, we bought 2% of the fund. We, we used the offshore allowance to acquire um, a position in the 2024 bonds um, on the basis that Sassel is a strategic asset will not be allowed to fail and that um, even in the event of a, uh, a recapitalization, you as a bondholder will be made whole. The other way to think about it is if I'm buying the debt at half of its face value, the 200 billion that was on the previous chart, I'm, I'm, I'm investing at, at, uh, with the debt at 100 billion, and given that Sassel has net assets of 200 billion Rand, we're fairly confident that even if it were to go into liquidation, that one would get a recovery um, on that initial purchase. The next company I'm going to talk to um, is Bidcorp. Um, here I'm showing the share price and year to date uh, to the trough in March, the share was down 44%. Um, Bidcorp is a stock uh, to which the equity fund did not have a position prior to March, uh, but in, as, as a result of this significant price fall, it prompted us to have a closer look. And uh, we have subsequently um, purchased um, and closed what was an underweight position in the portfolio. For those who aren't familiar, Bidcorp is a food service business. This is an image of one of their trucks in the UK, in London. Um, it is, as some would you know, 
can imagine, somewhat in the eye of the storm, um, in the sense that most of the customers that bid food um, services are in the hospitality industry, restaurants, hotels, um, as well as corporate um, uh, canteens and the like. And obviously with the, as, with the advent of the lockdown, um, these, you know, the, the trading activity of these businesses or these customers um, has, has been put on hold, um, the, which is what the market is most concerned about. What we like about Bidcorp is that it is a geographically diversified business. So it's a global business. It is in there, it's therefore a beneficiary of brand weakness. It earns a larger share of profits um, from outside of South Africa. It does have a South African business that in this chart um, is captured in the, the top of the stack in the, in the emerging market division. Um, what this chart shows is the operating profit uh, generated from each region. And what we can observe is that this business over time has delivered steady uh, compound growth in profits. Um, and that as we look into 2020 and 2021, those are forecasts, um, there is this expected decline um, in the profit of the group as a result of um, the, the known impacts of coronavirus. Um, admittedly, it, it, you know, I think what needs to be debated is how long does it take for normal activity to return such that the profit generated in, you know, in the future can uh, get back to that 2019 level. In, the, in assessing the valuation, uh, what we're showing in this chart is uh, similar to the SASOL, is, is, the, is the enterprise value. So the shaded green is the market capitalization of Bitcorp. Um, and the key difference between the SASOL example is that net debt within Bitcorp is a relatively small proportion of this group. Uh, net debt to its profit um, is less than 0.6 times. Um, on the right-hand scale, we've got a measure of profitability, um, EBITDA, the operating profit before interest, tax, and depreciation. Um, and that red step line um, is the historic uh, delivered uh, profits um, that is, is on the right-hand scale. And we've scaled the chart such that it reflects what we think is a fair value for the group of 12 and a half times. Um, what one can observe um, by virtue of the fact that the shaded area uh, throughout the period 2013 to, to uh, prior to the, the, the fall in March, it traded above um, that red line. And so in effect was trading on a multiple higher than 12 and a half times. And for this reason, we had always considered it to be um, expensive. However, in the fall, we can see that the, the, you know, having delivered 8 billion rand of profit, um, the market you know, fell 44%, the share price fell 44%, uh, such that its, its trailing multiple was less than 10 times um, uh, its last reported EBITDA. We have subsequently seen those downgrades to the coming year's uh, expected profits, um, but we you know, uh, took the opportunity to build a position in what we believe is a high quality business uh, with low leverage and an ability to, has shown an ability to grow into the future. Um, just a reminder, please send through questions um, as, as this presentation uh, progresses. Uh, Hamilton and I will be addressing the Q&A at the end. Uh, we are more than halfway now, um, and I've got two last stocks to discuss. Uh, the next company um, I'm going to uh, highlight as a, what we see as a, an opportunity to generate um, exceptional returns from these levels um, is the MTN Group. Um, MTN was a company that uh, was, you know, or was a share that we already own in the portfolio. Um, and here we can just see that year to date um, to the trough in March, uh, MTN fell 64%. Um, you know, why the, the extreme uh, price action? Um, I've tried to summarize in the heading, uh, but this is an economy, uh, uh, this is a, uh, this MTN is a pan-African mobile operator, but is exposed to economies and countries throughout Africa and the Middle East that are oil dependent. So again, the weak oil price um, threatens uh, the, the, those economies. And in particular, the most significant is MTN Nigeria, 
where the local currency, the Naira, um, is uh, facing an almost inevitable uh, devaluation. Um, and then the real challenge or one of the concerns the market has is that MTN um, does have debt on its balance sheet um, and a large portion or you know, almost 60% of that debt is, is dollar denominated um, that is dependent on these uncertain volatile cash flows from Africa uh, in order to service that debt. But in light of this price action, again, what I'm, you know, the question we ask ourselves is what are we being asked to pay? What's in the price? And um, you know, are we potentially being given an opportunity where all the bad news, uh, particularly around MTN Nigeria, is already uh, reflected in the current share price? This is just uh, to set the scene. Um, this is a typical uh, airtime vendor uh, in, in Lagos, uh, Nigeria. Um, this is a key market for uh, MTN. Um, it's certainly not the, it's not, it's, it's not as significant as it once was because it has already seen uh, currency devaluation. Um, this chart uh, represents the sort of uh, our, our best estimate of what each of the parts of the group are, are worth. Um, in the case of Nigeria and Ghana, we have used a market value. These shares, uh, these, these, these uh, subsidiaries are listed in their respective countries and therefore we can um, observe a market price for the asset um, that we have reflected here on a RAND per MTN group share price. Um, the first is South Africa making up sort of 45 Rand. Nigeria is a similar contribution to the, to this, to the group's value. Uh, Ghana is significantly smaller. And then the other uh, 17 operation or opcos uh, make up 27 Rand. Um, in addition, MTN have embarked on a strategy of trying to monetize what it has identified as non-core assets. Uh, these represent a further 9 Rand a share. And then lastly, um, in terms of a value contribution, we have the IHS Tower Company, um, MTN Nigeria, effectively sold uh, its tower network to IHS um, a few years ago in exchange for shares in, in IHS. Uh, this is carried on MTN's uh, balance sheet at a carrying value of 27 billion Rand, um, which you know, uh, we, we have reflected here on a Rand per share basis. Offsetting these assets is the debt, as I referred to. Um, MTN does have uh, debt, um, and a portion of that debt is, is dollar denominated. That uh, rep, you know, deducts 41 Rand a share, leaving you with a potential fair value uh, for uh, MTN group of 116 Rand. But this uh, is at the prevailing exchange rates. As I've said in the introduction, we believe that there is an inevitable uh, devaluation uh, risk facing uh, these African currencies that are reliant on oil um, export revenues. And so in the, in the scenarios we've looked at, uh, we, we've, we've made an assessment of what if uh, the Nigerian currency and the Ghanaian currency were to devalue by 30%. Um, and in an, uh, an even worse case scenario, what if they were to lose 50% of their value? And then lastly, because IHS uh, represents Nigerian towers, um, it is a company that is looking to list itself, in which case uh, MTN would be able to um, extract some, some value. But what if that asset was deemed to have no value? So we deduct the 14 Rand. So under this scenario, uh, taking account of you know, what we consider to be quite a negative outlook for those currencies, um, uh, uh, hair cutting them by 50%, you know, we still see a share price that should, or a value of MTN that is worth 71 Rand um, in relation to the current share price that is now trading at 49, but in the middle of March uh, fell below 40 Rand. And we used that opportunity um, to uh, take a larger position. And so, you know, we, we think that there is, you know, almost 40% upside, even if we, you know, uh, haircut some of the values attached. Another way of looking at MTN um, is to look at, uh, you know, the other concern the market has is, 
will I, you know, will we be able to service this debt? Um, this chart represents um, the, the cash flow that uh, the group upstreams from its um, non-South African operations, um, as well as the cash uh, profit after all capex in South Africa that is available um, to fund, you know, a service debt, but also fund a dividend. The red line represents the dividend that has been paid. And one of the you know, criticisms of MTN over the last four years was the fact that it was paying out um, or, or maintaining a dividend payout policy uh, despite not having available cash that has led to uh, the increased debt on balance sheet. Um, that, there has been subsequent change of management um, and management under, under new leadership have been embarking on you know, the, the asset realization program referred to. But the main point here is that the purple bars at the bottom represent the interest on the net debt. So this is the finance cost that needs to be serviced. And the primary point I want to draw your attention to is the green or the, the cash available, free cash flow available from the South African operations, which in December uh, to, or in the financial year 19 accounted for 6 billion Rand. Um, and what we can see is that we don't need cash flow. If we assume that the Nigerian dividend were to, or that there were capital controls and there was no ability to get any cash flow out of these African operations, we're confident that the South African business alone will be sufficient to meet the demands on servicing of the net debt. And lastly, it brings me to the last um, uh, company I'd like to discuss today, which is GrowthPoint. Um, this is a listed uh, property stock. Um, the you know, uh, property sector has come under extreme pressure uh, year to date, um, and GrowthPoint is, has not been spared either, having lost half its value um, between the you know, uh, beginning of the year and March. Um, what is the market's concern here? Obviously, the lockdown um, you know, um, has imposed restrictions on trading activity and normal business. Uh, this has led to retailers that occupy some of the shopping malls that GrowthPoint owns. Um, demanding that they will uh, pay a reduced rent during the period of lockdown. Um, any sort of extension to the lockdown is likely to lead to um, business failures and rising vacancies. Um, and re, re, you know, there is this high likelihood that we'll see uh, negative rent reversions as, um, as we emerge from lockdown. Um, and as with other companies discussed today, GrowthPoint has debt. The nature of um, uh, property REITs is that they uh, fund a large portion of their uh, increased um, growth in their property portfolio through the use of um, debt. And uh, GrowthPoint has both domestic debt and offshore debt. And that the market is clearly concerned that there is a, you know, these, these various factors are likely to see um, a reduction in the distributions going forward. Um, but what, what is in the price, as always, is the question we ask. Um, what are we being asked to pay for? And is there not potentially a lot of bad news um, with uh, GrowthPoint having traded as low as 11 Rand last month? This, for those of you who don't have the, uh, who aren't fortunate enough to live in the mother city, is an image of uh, the VNA waterfront, uh, in particular the district silo. This is an asset uh, that, is, that is co owned by. GrowthPoint and the PIC. Um, it is a significant asset in, in um, GrowthPoint's portfolio, um, but represents you know, just less than 10% of the portfolio. Um, and what I'd like to present today is the idea that you are getting to buy this asset at a significant discount to its last reported carrying value. So here we have the price to net assets, um, the book value um, in effect of the property portfolio. So the gross asset value less the debt um, and uh, as a ratio of the, the market capitalization. And what we can see is that for the entire growth point group, you're getting to buy those assets at almost a 50% discount. 
But what I find more interesting is that Growth Point has two offshore listed companies, property companies. It has two investments. It owns a stake, just less than 30% of a London listed global worth that owns properties in Romania and Poland. And then in addition, it has a 66% uh, stake in Growth Point Australia that is also listed. And here in this, um, these two charts, we've looked at the distribution yield on the left, and we've looked at the price to net assets on the right, but we have taken those investment assets, offshore investments at their market value, deducted that from the market cap of growth point, as well as deducting their proportional share of the distributions received, as well as their proportional share of the net assets. And so in the red line, we can observe that the, South, the implied distribution yield on the growth point South African portfolio that includes the waterfront um, in, in March was expected to yield you know, or was offering you a potential yield of in excess of 50%. Um, it has subsequently rallied somewhat, um, but even today that, that is offering you a very attractive 27%. If we adjust for what we consider to be financial engineered um, profits that are that that uh, shouldn't be uh, considered ongoing in nature. Um, that distribution yield can be, um, you know, adjusted by uh, one quarter, but it would still leave you earning, you know, the potential to earn 20% uh, from that South African property portfolio, which we find incredibly attractive when one considers that the bond yields today, the 10-year bond yield is now back below 9.5%. On the right-hand side, just looking at the implied uh, price to net assets, um, there you can see that that uh, waterfront asset in effect, you're getting to buy it at a 60% discount uh, to its net asset value. And so we would argue that a lot of this concern around um, all those negative um, factors is largely reflected in the price and that as and when lockdown uh, were to, to end, we, we take comfort from the fact that already we've had some updates to suggest you know, retail activity uh, in the month of April has, um, has improved. So in wrapping up today's presentation, I just wanted to leave you or remind you about the long-term track record of the Prudential Equity Fund. We are certainly disappointed in the last 12 months and the underperformance that we have um, delivered. Um, but over the long run, we uh, remain, you know, uh, we have a robust process and, you know, we are confident that the implementation of that process will continue to deliver, you know, superior results for you as unit holders. Um, the, the fund has maintained you know, top quartile performance on a rolling three-year basis. Um, it has beaten the peer group as, as shown in the, the, the solid black line. The fund is in red and the um, FTSE All Share uh, SWIX index is in the, the blue line. All of the funds that make up the general equity unit trust category are shown in the gray uh, background lines. I thank you again for uh, taking the time to listen to this uh, presentation today. Um, I'm going to hand back now to uh, Hamilton and we uh, will attempt to answer any questions that you have uh, sent through. Thank you. Um,